the Olvipin LP838. Is it any good? Short answer, not really. This is the Olvipin LP838, which at a retail price of $12 shipped to me in Finland puts it quite proudly at the place of the cheapest complete amplifier we've ever tested on this channel and uh, it certainly does live up to that name since it seemed to be a quite bad idea to connect up any kind of speaker to it since uh, at the moment we have about 2 volts of DC on the output of the subwoofer output. So the rundown of this amplifier is that it's a 2.1 amp and uh, that's about as far as the seller specifications will go. They claim it to be 200 watts which is an obvious lie and uh, I think they specify to run for 12 volts but beyond that it's pretty much just a guessing. But the actual performance of this particular amplifier is entirely irrelevant as it, this would just destroy your bass speaker in a quite short amount of time. But let's ignore that for a moment and uh, just uh, connect up the left and right channels to our distortion meter to get a sense of how much power this thing will actually put out. Alright, so we are now feeding the amplifier a 1 kilohertz sine wave. We are monitoring the output on this multimeter. As you can see, we've got 989 hertz at 1 volt, and we are watching the distortion on the analog scale. And we are at the 3% distortion full scale, which means that 1% distortion is right at the one arrow there. Uh, which I would class as hard clipping horrible sound, so let's see how loud we can go. We are also connected up to 4 ohm load to really let this amplifier put it as much as it possibly can despite its low 12 volts of supply voltage, so let's just turn the volume up. 2 volts. Uh, we're just at 2.6 volts into 4 ohms, which is... Uh, somewhere between 2 and 3 watts. But let's not get let distortion get in our way, let's switch to the 30% distortion full scale instead and just keep turning it up until we just... Uh, perhaps we can do a bit more 10% distortion. We're over 3 volts now and we are getting 4.6 volts into 4 ohms at 10% distortion, which is pretty much 5 watts. So the performance of this amplifier is pretty much two orders of magnitude below what the advertisement said. Not much to anybody's surprise but this really is piss poor to be honest. You'd get four times more out of Villa Pie which costs like eight dollars more at the worst. So I really cannot recommend this amplifier. So with that technicality out of the way we can be pretty certain that the inners of this amplifier are going to be pretty crusty so let's just take it apart and have a look. And if you want to know how the broken bass channel performs, well at 100 hertz into 4 ohms it'll do just about a watt at 1% distortion and about 2 watts at 10%. And I just went back to double check my measurements and uh, now that the amplifier's warmed up we're just getting about 1 watt per channel on the left and right channels as well. So what we have here is, and let's be really generous about this, a 2 times 1 watt plus uh, 2 watt amplifier. So we've got a total output power of about 4 watts if you combine all the channels. So let's see how they've managed to create something which just performs so dreadful. And I can tell you from just putting my hand on it but this is not a class D amplifier because this thing runs warm. So this assembly is pretty straightforward, you just have a couple of screws front, a couple of screws back, some stuff holding the back plate on just to get them out. And you also have these three screws around the bottom which do hint at what this amplifier might be all about. And apart she comes. And the first thing you see is there are no inductors. Now those screws around the bottom, they're for holding the amplifier ICs in place. The linear class AB amplifier chips. So let's have a bit of a closer look at the board. Uh, so the first most obvious thing which jumps out at you is this rather not very well mounted capacitor. Uh, it's a, a 22,000 micro for 25 volt uh, 
Uh, and we've got a 820 microfarad 16 volt for you connected probably in parallel with it. Yep, both in parallel. Uh, and we've got uh, the signal, it runs straight into this potentiometer forming a divider, which this is the main volume potentiometer. And then you've got the base and treble potentiometer right beside it and the base volume. Uh, these two are actually a tone control for the front, left and right channels and this one only affects the volume for the subwoofer. On this particular unit the base uh, subwoofer uh, seems to only react on this part, it doesn't seem to be connected to this one at all. I'm not certain if that's a fail or if it's uh, supposed to be that way. And actually, the nice thing about this amplifier, which you rarely see in these Chinese, is that uh, they have put a reverse diode on the input to uh, prevent you from connecting it up backwards and exploding it, which is actually a very nice thing to see. And we have a ferrite bead there too. That's a bit of an oddity. You would not expect to see that. I'm quite surprised. Uh, other than that, we just have random caps. These are AC coupling caps for everything. The brands for everything is random and there are lots of used components. Uh, uh, this is uh, either a fake or a used uh, Chemicon cap. Uh, these are LTEX. The, the black ones are labeled the Canicon. And this one's a Yichcon. So it's pretty much junk bin components. And these are labeled. Uh, a Jeff, I think. Yeah, you tell me that's not a Jeff branded cap. So if we flip the board over, we have the main attractions of the board, which are the amplifier ICs. And uh, the first thing you should know about these, which becomes very obvious if we zoom into the solder joints, is that these are used chips. These are chips which uh, somebody has uh, salvaged from probably some old car stereos. Uh, the solder joints were actually broken out of a box when I got them. I've actually had to rework these in order to get any functionality out of the amplifier. But these chips are used. And if we flip them over, we should be able to get some numbers off of them. So, this, the base amplifier, is a Toshiba TA8201AK. And the left and right channel amplifier is a Philips TDA7057AQ. And, well, for what it's worth, these are brand chips. They are unlikely to be knockoffs, but yeah, this one's broken because it comes out of a used car stereo. And if we have a dig around the internet, we can find some data sheets for these. So the front left and right channels amplifier is uh, advertised to be a 2 times 8 watt stereo BTL audio output amplifier with DC control functionality which is not utilized and it's rated for a staggering 5.3 watts per channel into 8 ohms at 12 volts or 8 watts per channel at 15 volts into 8 ohms, all specifications at 10% distortion. So this one is probably relatively within spec because it's not even rated to drive our 4 ohm load, uh, but the performance is abysmal. Something worthy of note about this chip is also that the datasheet was revised April 7th 1998. And this chip actually comes from the Philips Semiconductor, or NXP's, official website. So this is likely to be the latest revision you can get. As for the base amplifier, uh, it's a, a more normal car audio device rated for 17 watts into 4 ohms at 10% distortion, which is pretty much the same as you'll get out of every car stereo IC ever made, uh, except for really bad ones like this. So if this actually worked, it would at least be performing as about as well as you can with a 12 volt supply and normal speakers. But yeah, compared to the Class D amplifiers that it's competing with in today's market, it's just absolute garbage. It's going to be extremely inefficient and it's likely to overheat even though it's actually heating to the external case. And of course in this case the IC is broken and will put out 2 volts of DC and break your speakers. So it's a bit of a moot point. So that's about all there is to say about the Ulverpin LP838. 
It's a cheap piece of shit built out of literal garbage out of a landfill. But uh, since I just happen to have a giant bank of 48 volt batteries uh, underneath my workbench, uh, I figured we'd just uh, uh, give it a bit of a go to see how 48 volt compatible Vilverpin is. Well, that one came off. So let's try for the reverse polarity protection while we're at it. Oh, I think it's busted. But hey, at least they bothered to put a fuse. Man, they really do fancy their fuses, don't they? So there you go, that's the Olverpin LP838, a steaming crock of shit right where it belongs. Cheerio. I just connected it up to power after setting it up to all that and it just started smoking. Alright, I'm not sure how well you're going to see this but uh, something's literally on fire in there.